really excited to talk to you today about how I think drones have become a critical part of our Earth observation portfolio. I wanted to start with just a little bit about my backstory. So I'm really interested in the Great Barrier Reef and since the late 90s I've been working to answer just one question and that's how much live coral do we have on the Great Barrier Reef? Because actually we really don't know and in some ways that's kind of surprising but in some ways not and this is this is really critical for us to understand. So one of the things that I'd like to do is just sort of have a look at, so the Great Barrier Reef, it covers this area along the Queensland coast. It's about two and a half thousand kilometers. And altogether, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park covers an area of about the size of Victoria plus Tasmania put together. So when you think of it like that, in such a large area, it's not really that surprising that we don't know how much live coral we have, but we really need to get to having that baseline understanding so we know how things change over time. So I wanna go into the southeast corner of the Great Barrier Reef, and I'm gonna take you into Heron Reef, which is where I started doing a lot of my research in the late 90s so here's the reef here here's the island it's about 800 meters long by 400 meters north south the university of queensland has a research station here which is why i got started working on heron here there's also a resort but it's a really magnificent place to work now as i come in i'm going to zoom all the way into this and so we're looking at commercially available satellite data here and i'd just like you to think of the question can you see how much live coral we have? And even for an untrained eye, you can probably understand that it's, it's kind of difficult to distinguish the differences that we have here. We know some of it's coral, some's live, some's dead, some's algae. And so this is what we get with satellite data. And for me, this is really important as to why I started getting into drones, because this is the information that we can get from drone data. So from a number of different reefs around the world here, both deep and shallow reefs, you can start to see all the different patches of live coral here. As we come across, you can see that the conditions are different. So sometimes it's a little bit ripply and we don't see it quite so well, but the beautiful colors are really standing out and we can start to see different genus in some of these images as well. And I really like this one. I just sort of think of it as being like a, a big smorgasbord of confetti and it's just really, really beautiful. And that information is just not in, drone, in, in the satellite data. Even when we come to some of the images like this, I can start to count individual sea cucumbers. And I'll make the link for this presentation available as well, so you can zoom in and have a look for yourself and really interact with us too. From some deeper data there as well, we can see that even in the deep water when it's quite blue, we can distinguish the individual patches on the reef. So what are some of the other benefits about using drones? Well, I've already shown that we definitely get a lot more detail from the drone data. So satellite data on the left hand side, this is planet five meter satellite data. And on the right hand side here, you can see the difference with the drone data and how much detail we see both on land, but in the water as well. So we're much, much closer to the features of interest. Now it's also really easy for us to just get out and fly when and where we need. Now this might be important if we're thinking about tidal areas, for example, and it's really important to get data at a particular time of day. You don't have to worry about specific satellite overpasses. Now I also really think it's important to think about some of those weather conditions where we can't capture satellite data. Yes, we might be able to get radar data, but optical satellite data is a real pain in disaster situations if we need data then and there, but hey, it's cloudy. So we just don't get that information. With drones, we can fly underneath it. I also like that you can pick up a drone from your local electronics store, JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, and you can get out and get started. These things are really quite small and it's quite easy to get started with that. So anyone anywhere can start to capture these data. And finally, we have some really cool data processing that we can do that allows us to look not just at the imagery itself, but we can also extract these 3D models. And so in this case, I'm really interested in looking at the terrain and we can start to see how the elevation changes over the areas. We can get this 
three-dimensional texture we can look at the height of trees or even corals if we're interested underwater as well so some really interesting processing techniques that we can use with drones that again just aren't available to us with satellite data one of the other reasons I really like working with drone data is because I see some really great opportunities for calibrating and validating our satellite data modeling. So whether that's global land cover or in this case in the Allen Coral Atlas, looking at the coral reefs of the world. Now this works on a global scale, but how good is it on a local scale? So I recently spent some time in Belize and I'm gonna come into this area here and look at the classification from the Atlas compared to our drone data. And so what you'll be able to see is that although we're looking at the same types of categories, so for example, the pink here is coral, green is seagrass, rock, rubble, bit of sand, and this is representing the island here. When we peel away the classification based on five meter satellite data, and we look at what the drone data looks like underneath, that it's actually quite different. So for example, based on field work, I know that this area here that's covered in pink as coral is actually all seagrass along here. This is all seagrass here too. The island is a very different shape to what satellite data would have us believe because of that resolution issue and the satellite modeling also stops when the water gets a little bit deeper but we can actually see that there still is some coral there as well. So what implications does this have for any management decisions that we're making and any interventions that we may want to that we may need to do. But so one of the other challenges is that the satellite data are fantastic for really, really broad areas. And we get a, we get a good idea of this here. Again, this is the planet data. But then we zoom in to drone data and then it's not necessarily enough as well. So it's just part of the portfolio of Earth observation. We have some snorkel data taken just below the surface. And then we zoom all the way in to some dive data as well. And you can actually see some calibration targets. You can see our field site and some gorgonians or soft corals here. So this is just all part of the package where everything works together. Back to our snorkeling, our drone, and then all the way out to our satellite data as well. But so one of the challenges is that we can't do field data everywhere. So it might get us the detail that we need, but what I'd like you to take away from this video here is really this feeling of scale and how teeny tiny Dr. Javier Leon is as he's snorkeling along the reef here. His buddy's just about to come into view. And as we pull out, you'll just see the scale of just one of 3000 reefs of the Great Barrier Reef. In this case, this is Heron Island. So you really should appreciate that field data just isn't possible everywhere but we can't drone everywhere either and this is sometimes how I feel I feel kind of small when I'm out there droning and so this for me where global collaboration comes into play and in this case we can have a look around the world that there's people using drone data for all sorts of earth observation reasons and so for example we've got Rene Bartolo working in Kakadu National Park we have collaborators in in India and Nepal we can go up to northern Europe and in this case Poland and look at some of the glaciers and other really really cold areas around the world that maybe we don't necessarily get the opportunity to get to we can come into the US and again we've got in this case some urban infrastructure what about if we head on over to Africa in this case we're hitting hitting Uganda and looking at urban infrastructure there and what the differences are as well or even into South America where we're looking at post fire and some challenges that we have in the ecosystems over there. But so one of the challenges that I then experienced was I know that there's people around the world doing this sort of work that's quite similar to what I do in all sorts of different ecosystems. But how can we make the work that we're all doing findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable or fair? And so I came up with this idea though, what if we actually made it really simple for people to contribute and really work together in this way? So the case is here, we capture our data relatively simple to start with. Once we've got all of our raw drone mapping images, all these overlapping photos, we upload them into a central repository. At that point, the platform author mosaics your data. So it then makes it available out of like a map here with all the metadata that it's either extracted or you've input for yourself there as well. And it's all stored together. 
and you can store your own data and share it in this way as well. So in this case, this is my profile, I've got data over here in Belize, some data around here in Australia. So I see it as dots on the map and I see it in my table of contents. But if that's not enough for what I'm doing or if I'm unable to collect data for myself in certain locations, I can actually go around the world and access other people's data as well. And so that's really cool if I need to start thinking about, well, what are other data sets that I might need to test and adjust there as well? I can refine that specifically by a type of ecosystem. And in this case, we're using the IUCN habitats. So we've got all the different categories and I could say, well, maybe I'm working in grasslands in this case. I can see all the different data sets that are there. Perhaps I've got an AI model that I've tested in my local area and I need to see if it's going to scale to other, other areas, other geographies around the world there as well. And then one of the cool things is that not just looking at on platform, access we're then able to stream directly into other systems or other gis that you're using there as well which is really important when you want to continue analyses there in your own packages as well and so to me this all comes down into what i'm trying to build which i like to call the circular data economy and if we think about the way we work in, in our daily lives in other aspects outside of data a lot of the time we're trying to move away from a linear economy which is where we have products and materials that are created or manufactured, consumed, and then discarded. That's linear. So what we try and do is to work more into the reuse, recycle, upcycle. And so by doing that, we're keeping our products and materials in circulation for far longer. And that's what we call a circular economy. So I'm really interested in how we apply that to the data that we capture as well. So we build a system where you, you can capture the data, contribute it to a global repository, and then we curate that as well. So bringing it all together in one place for people to access via that FAIR system that I mentioned. It enables people outside your own immediate network, so anyone around the world can create something with those data. So they can develop insights and management decisions and then build collaborations as well and then feed back into other areas where we might need to capture more data too. So in this way, we're really believing that all data has a life beyond that for which it was initially captured. And if we can all work together, we're really building an awesome system that we can, we can use to continue building insights and making better management decisions in the long run. And I think in the words of Sir David Attenborough, I think he put it perfectly. So if working apart, we're a force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, surely working together, we're powerful enough to save it. Thanks so much for listening.